And we're live from the res here with special guest, Mr. Philip Espinosa, the runner. How you doing today, man? I'm pretty good. How are you, Ralph? Good. It's good to see you. Um, for those who don't know, when I showed up here, um, saw Philip's car outside. He'd already taken off. He'd already ran his run and he'd already gotten back. So yeah. he did a little uh, little trek through the res here, huh? And yeah, I just uh, went up the grade um, about four and a half miles. So four and a half miles up, four and a half miles down. It's a really nice grade. Um, so about nine miles. Um, yeah, it was a nice run. So. Do you get excited by the weather, or does the weather have an impact on you at all? Does it, like when it starts raining, you're like, ah man, and then the springtime comes, you're like, yeah, or does it have an impact at all? Oh yeah, no, I, I can't do heat. This is my prime time for, um, for running. Like in the winter when it's colder. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm loving it right now. It's cool weather. Uh, spring is fine, but the summer I can't I can't hang. It's uh, anything usually above sixty or seventy degrees, and I melt because it's um, I sweat a lot, mm -hmm. um, and so I lose a lot of salt, and then cramping happens. Um, I usually cramp, but right now I'm fine. Like um, like these last couple months, and if it's raining, I'd rather it be raining and miserable. I'd rather run in hail and freezing cold. Um, than like 90 degree heat you know yeah so, so yeah i'm thriving in this kind of weather i i i mean rain sucks if you're running for like a whole day but i mean for like a, a short like hour two hour run it's nice you know <laughs> people listen to this going short two hour run yeah so how long do you generally run on an average day what's like your typical day I'm just go out for a stroll yeah so um it depends on what i'm training for um, okay but so right now I'm trying to hit 100 mile weeks, so that's going to be about 14 miles a day. Um, and so it's between 10 and 15 miles a day, I'd say, on average. Uh, last year, I think I got like 3,500 miles in, in the year, so that comes out to an average of almost 10 miles a day. But the thing is, that's an average, and so there's some, that includes a lot of the races that I've done, which you know can go upwards of 100, 150 miles. So there are some days where I don't do anything i take it off and it's kind of rare i try to keep running every single day um but yeah i generally try to do uh 10 to 15 miles when i'm training for uh one of my races that i do wow that's pretty remarkable now when i met you those years ago at this point and um you were pretty uh you weren't as fit as you are today you're a little chubby yeah and i remember you um kind of start sharing that you were going to start getting into running I think at that point when I met you, you'd already kind of started. You ran, you were running probably, I don't know, a couple miles maybe. I don't know. And yeah. then you start charting on uh, your social media that you were, I remember there was a day that I saw you, like you ran, I don't know, maybe like 10 miles or something. I was like, wow, this dude's really running a long way now. Like he's really yeah. dedicated. Um, how, how, when you first started running, how, I guess, how far were you running? What was your minimal distance? Did you start off at like a mile or? Yeah, no, when I first started running, it was like a, I started off, I was like 235 pounds, you know, so I was pretty, I got up there and, you know, I was always like, I was always a bigger person. I thinned out towards the end of high school and into college, um, but then I gained a lot of weight back. But um, I told myself if I could run one mile a day, then I would be really fit. Um, and I still think that's a good marker for fitness, but my... I started off from, I'm not a runner. I mean, I am a runner, but I'm not, I wasn't a runner uh, growing up. You know, I, yeah. I started after uh, college. I went to school at UCSD, uh, graduated there in 2011. And I think that's roughly around the time that I met you. Yeah. And I started wanting to lose weight because I got up to 235 pounds. And so I started running a little bit, but it was mainly just to lose weight. Right. And so I also went to the gym. I went to 24 hour fitness and it used, it used to be like, um, I was really like, uh, you know, well, I still am not really the richest person, but I was really, uh, poor back then. And so it's like my brother worked at 24 hour fitness and any, he would let me in any time he was working there. So it would probably be like at two or three in the morning. Sometimes I'd be getting workouts, but I started off on a fitness journey just to lose weight because I wanted yeah. to get under 200 pounds. But then once I started losing the weight, running started becoming um, 
fun uh, because you're able to lift your feet up off the ground and it's kind of miraculous you know you, you start understanding how people can see running as fun i never understood how running could be fun i mean it was always like a joke run for funners you know like it never made much sense to me growing up but once i started running and losing weight it became a lot easier and so uh you went i went from one mile a day to maybe I got up to like three miles and three miles was like a long run for me. And then maybe five miles was like the longest that I, I ran. And um, that's before I started getting into like the longer distances. And it never really occurred to me um, to start running longer than that until I had uh, a moment in my life where I had this, uh, it was a crucial moment in my uh, development into the person who I am today. Um, I was, running one night and after uh, after the workout, I was feeling extra good. And sometimes, you know, you get that runner's high and runner's high is uh, it's kind of like a thing you get if you aren't, I mean, I still get it occasionally, but that's, I don't get it all the time. But since I was starting off, uh, I was getting it more frequently. And so I was feeling really good. And then all of a sudden I uh, had this idea creep into my mind that I wanted to do something uh, really, really crazy and I had an idea to uh, do my spirit my, my spirit run my 90 mile spirit run uh, and that was I didn't know it was going to be 90 miles what what actually had started that thought was I'm going to run um, the same route that my great uncle Alfonso Soto ran when he ran away from uh, boarding school Sherman Indian boarding school uh, back in the day when he went I have this story of my family that was always been circulating that he ran away from uh, Sherman and ran back home to Mesa Grande. And that was kind of one of those things. It was like a tall tale kind of thing, you know, like, oh, you figure it kind of oral tradition kind of thing, you know, it's just like whatever. Yeah, like, but you, then you drive it in a car and you go, yeah, no way somebody did that. Right, exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. you get to Mesa Grande, and it's just at the top of a mountain. Yeah, and you know? I, I Google mapped it. I was like, what's the shortest route between there and here? And it ended up being 90 miles. And I'm like, wow, how in the heck? Uh, 90 miles. And so I thought to myself, like, I want to run that. And um, Whitney was there, uh, my girlfriend. She was my friend at the time. Yeah. Um, Who's also I, now a good runner. Yeah, yeah. I influenced her into becoming a runner. Yeah. She's from Kuwait. Um, But she was there at the time, and I came back, and I was sweating, and I was out of breath. And I said, hey, Whitney, I have this really crazy idea. <laughs> and I know it's going to sound crazy. This is the craziest thing I've ever thought of, but I'm going to run 90 miles. And I wasn't maybe, I maybe went one to two, three, uh, three miles maybe at a time. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to run from Sherman and Riverside all the way home to Mesa Grande. It's going to be 90 miles. And she was like, okay. And I mean, she, she knows I do crazy stuff all the time. So she was kind of, she wasn't doubtful. It was just like, okay, cool. Um, and so the plan was I wasn't going to do it in one go because I didn't think that was possible. Um, so I was going to, I wanted to make it hard enough for a challenge for myself, but yeah. also doable. So what I decided to do was split it over three days. So uh, 90 miles in three days, that's 30 miles a day. Um, and so I set up this whole um, event behind it. And I said I was going to go from like not being a runner to being able to do this in a year. I gave myself a year to do this. This was supposed to be kind of like a like a coming of age for myself, I was 23. And it was supposed to be something that would help ground me in uh, a struggle of the past to help guide me towards a, a future. Um, and so I realized that I needed that connection to where I came from, like a personal connection in order to have uh, guidance um, that I didn't really have. And I know you know, a lot of that is uh, missing, you know, like those uh, coming of age ceremonies that we used to have regularly. It's like we don't have that. And so there um, we don't have that as much anymore. And so there's, you know, what it creates is that they say a prolonged adolescence. And I see it in my community. And I see a lot of communities where someone does turn 16, 17, you know, and they're not technically an adult, I guess, by modern society standards. Yeah. But they feel like an adult. They feel like they can make the decisions. They look like an adult, some of them, you know. And yeah. they started kind of getting into it with their uh, parent guardians. You know, they want to make their decisions of their life, but they're too young to really know anything. They're not an adult. And then when the, here comes 18 and you turn 18, it's like, well, where's the change? You know, yesterday don't seem any different than today. Right. You know, I'm 18 now. And it's like, 
So then what becomes the little marker? Is it like, oh, I graduated now? Sometimes some people are like, well, now you're out of high school. Go make a life. You know, is it when you turn 18? Is it uh, when you move out? Is it your first job? There's no rule. So some people sit there waiting for whatever it's going to be, this big epiphany or this big awakening. And they're 18. They say, well, I'll figure things out. I'll give it a couple years. And then 10 years go by. And now this person's almost 30. And they go, holy smokes, dude. Like, I haven't done anything with my youth. I've kind of just been having a good time or been figuring it out or been you know, whatever, but I haven't, like, I'm still kind of, some people still live with their parents, nothing wrong with that, but they just really haven't gone out and tried to find themselves yet. And they've just kind of been living like they did when they were 12 or 10. And it's like a prolonged adolescence as yeah. opposed to saying, okay, now you got to live your life a little different. You got to, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so, um, I know some tribes like the Apaches would have the, uh, their kids, uh, 15 years old, they would send them out into the wilderness for a week and just have them survive on their own. Yeah. And that was like a coming of age thing. It was kind of a thing to mark the transition from boyhood to manhood or a girlhood to womanhood. You know, yeah. it's like this is like a thing that you would go through in order to transition. And so um, I decided this is what I'm going to do for myself along those lines. You know, yeah. and so this is going to be a challenge for me and it's going to teach me some things along the way. And um and I'm going to become a better person for it. And I'm going to learn some things spiritually, um, physically for sure. Um, and it's going to be a, a really awesome event for myself that was going to help me guide myself towards a better future. You kind of created your own ceremony for yourself. Exactly. And, That's cool. um, you know, I didn't um, expect, I didn't expect it to, uh, garner any attention it was a personal thing mm -hmm. but it ended up being kind of a community event where people came out they ran with me and there was a uh, you know i had uh, help from uh charlene from Saquon. she mm -hmm. made Charlie shirts Royal. for it they did some yeah. publicity and stuff and it was really awesome like, i remember seeing that i was thinking wait he's gonna run the whole thing a lot of people were just kind of like question marks like wait what's he doing right it was like is this a run like they thought maybe they're like a relay team like right. no this dude's gonna run from there to here and I remember thinking to myself, like, all these guys are talking about the distance, this and that. But I know where Mesa Grandy's at. And I know geographically that's a mountain. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this guy's going to run all the way up. All yeah. the way. Phillip's running all the way up that mountain. Like, that's at the end of the run, too. It's not like you're starting out on a mountain. Like, you're going to be wiped out and then have to do this big, big uphill uh, run into the end there. Right. Uh, yeah. And it was uh, it was an honor of my great uncle, Alfonso Soto. He, mm -hmm. he, um, he lived until 1990. So, I mean, I was born in 88. Okay. I didn't really obviously have any memories of him or anything but he lived up in mesa grande by angel mountain road and it's funny because after uh, after doing this event a lot of people are still alive who remember uh my great uncle and it's funny they would come up to me and say oh i, I remember your uncle i remember your great uncle you know he would always ride his horses or whatever and he, you know he lived over there it's like or some people it was just really they thought it was really uh interesting because it's like they knew him as a person so imagine knowing like uh somebody in your life and then somebody does a, a memorial run for that person and say like, oh somebody's doing a random memorial run for uh for this guy that i grew up with and i knew it's like oh okay that's cool um but yeah it was a really awesome event and it was a life it actually it ended up being what it was meant to be you know and it changed my life and uh it's kind of hard to uh describe the effect that it had on me but it really um it was surreal uh, mm -hmm. especially the last day um because what it did is it brought my uh brought, brought my tribe together brought my community together in a way that i didn't really understand or i didn't think that it would be possible um but you know my uh chairman at the time and my dad um they did my dad didn't really like the chairman uh yeah at the time but good old res politics yeah <laughs> but they yeah. were there and i saw my yeah. dad hug mark and i was just like what the heck is happening like, wow that's cool and you know people were there my family was there and i was just like holy you know like holy crap like this happened because of me and i you know like it's really awesome to see um that something that I started off as just for myself became a community type event mm -hmm. and it was supposed to be a one year thing. I told myself I'm not a runner. I'm going to spend a year running, but after this I can get back to bodybuilding because I was I was kind of a bro <laughs> at the time. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't want to become a skinny runner. I wanted to become a bodybuilder. Um uh so I was like, okay, I'll get this done. 
And then after that, I will start going to the gym and making gains because that's what I wanted to do. I was 23, 24. I wanted to make some gains. But after that, I took a month off, you know, of running. And then I helped uh, I helped Whitney. She got inspired to run after that. And I helped her run her first uh, half marathon. And I was kind of jogging with her. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you kind of you get the itch again. And you're like, oh, man, this is kind of fun. I kind of miss it. I want to sign up for one of these races, you know, again. And it's like. Before I knew it, I started running again and started standing up for races. And I realized that um, it it was the path that uh, I was supposed to be on. You know, mm-hmm. like that, you know, sometimes you don't understand how things work. Sometimes things choose you. Your destiny chooses you kind of in a way. And so I feel like that was probably what happened. And so that was in 2013 was my spirit run. And it's 2020 today. So for last seven years i've been uh progressively um running and doing ultra running distances and i've been doing races where they have these um ultra marathons is what it's called and it's any distance longer than a marathon so a marathon is 26.2 miles and an ultra marathon is anything beyond that so anywhere from 31 miles which is a 50k up to uh, 100 miles plus you know and so now I'm training for a a 48 hour race, and I I usually do like like 100 mile races or something, 50 mile races, 100 mile races, and how long I, do those take? Those are 24 hour races, then? Yeah, like I don't want to say it's no problem, and it usually it'll, 100 miles can take anywhere from like 20 to 30 plus hours. So, and that's like pretty much nonstop continuous. You don't. You don't sleep or anything like mm-hmm. if it's a hundred mile race you go through the night um but there's these uh kind of a subdivision of ultra marathons where it's not focused on the distance so much as the time and they're called fixed time races okay. and so the fixed time races are however many miles you can do in a certain amount of time so it's like a jogathon when you're a little kid yeah, exactly okay. and so it can range from like three hours six hours 12 hours 24 hours 48 hours 72 hours or they have six day and ten day races where people wow. you have the really crazy people who like do a race and they run for like six days, ten days straight. So is that will they do laps or they're like, I'm gonna go laps. I'll be see you in Idaho. <laughs> yeah, no, laps. And wow. that's the craziest part about it. It's yeah. like it's maybe one, two mile laps at most. Oh my gosh, they're just doing that over and over and over. Yeah. And wow. most people, even ultra runners who like running long distances, they don't understand that. They, they think that's crazy. You know? <laughs> Why do that? Yeah. yeah they, I mean, but it's one of my favorite types of races is running around in circles uh, for 24 hours at a time. But that being said, it sucks. You know, like when you <laughs> run those distances, it's, yeah. it's not easy. And mentally it's, um, it's really hard. Uh, it's, it's harder mentally than it is physically. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you do the training, uh, training doesn't make it, easier it just makes it less sucky it makes it less difficult sounds like it's almost like your own unique uh, way of doing ceremony almost though oh, like, yeah it's like a continual way to kind of get back to yourself and to get yeah. back to things yeah definitely i mean and that's how it started off for me like with the spirit run mm-hmm. you know and um you know i've uh not every run i do is like an event like that like a spirit mm-hmm. run or you know a sacred run but every run is sacred in its own way and if you yeah. have that kind of mindfulness when you run um you know there's like for me running uh i started having an understanding of running as uh, a form of prayer and a form of medicine and a form of healing yourself um i was able to understand that uh running we don't understand everything uh about it in the sense that we understand that it's good for us and we understand it makes us feel good but we don't necessarily understand how or why. And I think a lot of it has to do with our connection to the land. And what we don't understand is that every time we're taking a step, we're making that connection with the land. And we need to, we need to have that connection with the land in order, in order to feel whole. And if we lose that connection to the land, then we lose ourselves and we lose our mind. And You hear a lot of culture say that though. Yeah. Like even with the birds singing and dancing, we talk about you you dance, you're stepping, you're making that connection. You're blessing the ground, the ground's blessing you, and we're kind of blessing each other in that in that space. Yeah. And I've heard other tribes say very similar to their tribal dances that you go to powwows, even you hear it there, you'll hear the announcer say, you know, the blessing of the 
of the ground as the feet touch the ground. And then that ground is ultimately blessing you as a person. And it's just like this big interconnected blessing, I guess, you know, just yeah. to be moving. Yeah. And so there's a lot of sense. spirituality behind it. And whether uh, whether or not you're actually making like skin contact with the ground or not, mm-hmm. you're still making that contact with the ground. And if you can make skin contact with the ground, that's even better, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of power behind it. And it doesn't just apply to natives. I think we're all tapping into it. A lot of the people who are runners like around the world, they they benefit from it the same way. They just don't have that same like understanding or they might see it as like hippy dippy type stuff or whatever. It's like, oh, well, no, it's about chemicals. No, it's because we need that connection. We are from this earth. You yeah. know, we can't go live. We can't go live in Mars or whatever. Like they had some expedition or whatever saying like, if you want to go live on Mars, or accepting <laughs> yeah. applications at NASA. Or it looks like a uh, total recall or something. There's right. no water there yet, but <laughs> there used to be or something. Right. No yeah. way would I. I mean, we are literally like uh, trees or plants. You know, we are of this earth. And right. the further we get away from it, um, then the more we kind of lose ourselves and we die, you know. Like, mm-hmm. we're plants. We you, you can only uproot us. And I don't want to go live on Mars. I don't know about you. Yeah, I ain't trying to live there. But yeah. that connection is what our, our old people have always talked about. So we as indigenous people always are like, you know, we have this connection to the land and our sacred sites and all of these things. And I think we kind of say these things and then almost become like uh, just something we say, but the meaning behind it, like, I, I don't know that everybody stops and really thinks about what does that mean? What does that contextualize as in modern times? Like, how does that, you know, represent what I do? Like, we're talking about coming of age ceremonies and puberty ceremonies. I was told a long time ago that like the manners, when you went to eat, like you fed the little kids, you fed the old people, you fed those who traveled in, like those are the people who eat first. And so like a, a little kid probably never went hungry like they never knew what it was to have hunger because they were always fed and taken care of um the old people were always taken care of those who traveled and were taken care of so if anybody was hungry it was probably somebody who was like a, a uh, young adult you know to you know, middle-aged adult or whatever yeah. they were the ones who would go hungry and it's kind of by right because they're the ones who are producing the food they're the ones who are supposed to be getting after it and there's not enough food then they're the ones who are going to pay the highest price for it. So part of our coming of age of ceremony was the idea that, okay, you're going to take this kid and he's never had hunger before, and we're going to put them through a ceremony. And part of that ceremony is going to be a fasting. And through the fasting, they have the hardships and they learn things and introspective and, and all these kind of things. But ultimately also they're just learning what it is to be hungry. And so when the ceremony is over, they kind of know like, wow, I don't like being hungry. I don't want to be hungry. I don't want the kids in my family to go hungry. I don't want my parents and old people to go hungry my grandparents you know so i'm going to do what i can for my community i'm going to give back whether it means i'm going to go i'm going to stay out there and hunt or i'm going to make the good arrows or i'm going to go pick the grass you know the you know whatever it is you know gather those chia seeds whatever needs to be i'm going to be a active um, participant in my community guarantee everybody eats well because i'm going to be the one starving and i don't want to starve and so to me i think of like that part of the puberty ceremony like you see injected into that person this mindset of like, I got to get after it. I got to go do something. And, you know, so it's easy to like tell those stories, but what does that look like today? Well, you see a kid who's 18, 19, like, well, figure it out. He's playing video games on the couch. It's like, okay, you play video games and enjoy yourself, but how are you helping your community? How are you helping, you know, the elders of your family? How are you helping the kids of your family? How are you giving back? And so I think today we kind of get really caught up in this, like, well, times have changed. We can't live the old way, but I don't think so. I think the old way teaches us it's just uh, vocabulary's changed and, and scenery's changed a little bit. But I think a lot of those old teaching, old ways are still here. Instead of hunting for a, um, you know, a deer, maybe you're hunting for a paycheck or, you're, you know, you're trying to, right. instead of bartering and trading, you know, you're out there uh, doing other means to make that cash to ultimately take care of yourself and take care of those around you. And, you know, because occupations have changed. For me, uh, I sing bird and that's my way to try to help my community. But, you know, same time, if, they're picking up chairs. I'll go out pick up chairs. You know, if there's trash things to pick up and if I can, I'll help. If I can help, I'll help whatever yeah. way. But I know that that's a way that I'm able to help and give back. Uh, and a long time ago, that was a profession to be able to just go out and sing for your community. And because you were called upon and they knew what that took out of your life and out of your time and, and everything. And it was a profession to be the orator, to be a singer, to be um, to be participant in those ceremonies. And a long time ago, running was a, was definitely like a very important job. It was the way that they communicated with each other. It was the way that they portrayed and do all these different things. Like it was a 
a full-time job to be a, a runner amongst our, not just our nation, but I know a lot of tribes had running as like a very important uh, profession. Yeah. And today I know I go out sometimes and I'll talk to people and I'll say, you know, our people lived in all, this is all our Kumeyaay land, is all Indian land. Our people walked here, they walked there, they ran all these places. But for, you know, I never really understood what that meant until I seen you do these things. Yeah. I said, wow, someone really can run from the beach to the mountains. Someone really can run from the mountains to the desert. Like, like one person, you know, like I've been, I've done it in a car, but to actually see somebody do it, it's like, wow, man, that's pretty, pretty cool. So you've been able to bring back that role of a runner and kind of represent that void that we've had for a lot of years where mm -hmm. people say, well, where's your traditional runner? Where's the Kumeyaay Nation runner? Or where's the, where's somebody who represents all of that talk that you guys say about running here and there? Like, is there anybody who can still do it? Me, I always go, well, yeah, Philip Espinosa. Yeah, you, ever, right. you ever see that guy? You'll go run like a... Give me a message. Yeah. I'll, I'll send it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it'll beat your text. You know? Right, exactly. But do you feel that? Do you feel like you feel uh, like filled a void in that? Because I see it. I feel that. You, you oh, know. yeah. No, that's um, that's a large part of why I do what I do. And um, like I was explaining to you earlier, um, sometimes we don't understand like our path in life. Sometimes like I feel like... Uh, I didn't choose this path they kind of chose me and i never wanted to be a runner i, I mean and i still kind of like i think <laughs> i didn't choose sucks. thug life thug life chose exactly, me exactly you, know? <laughs> you know and so but i really feel like that's um that's uh how i that's a big uh purpose that's a big goal of mine in life is to uh remind people that this is i feel like maybe i was a, a runner like a you know a traditional runner in a past life and um, you know, I'm just continuing on uh, the mission. And, it's and definitely in your genetics because a while back we had uh, your cousin in here, um, Dom Espinosa, yeah. Dominic, and, and he went out and ran a marathon in, in uh, Phoenix area, and he's going to run one here in May for the rock and roll. And But he's, he's a marathon runner. He's your cousin. I was like, whoa, what's the chance yeah. of having a, a family where you have two two distance runners like that you yeah know? it's crazy you i know, guess in the old world it's probably common but nowadays i don't see a lot of that but it yeah. has to be in your genes because you guys are both great runners yeah no we're pretty we're pretty close in age too and it's interesting because uh you know he he grew up out there in arizona and then mm -hmm. i grew up here but like we kind of lived like parallel lives or like similar we it's just interesting that we both ended up becoming runners you know so i think there is something to that yeah it's inter code man it's somewhere in there oh yeah and i believe it's in it's in everybody's uh you know everybody has the ability uh, like everybody has different abilities in terms of like the, the extent to which they can do it mm -hmm. i mean it can everybody run 100 miles like i do i i don't know uh, but i know everybody can run and yeah everybody can uh keep active we have we all had different body types and whatnot but I mean, I'll never uh, accept the idea that, oh, uh, there's a certain like type of like runner or body type or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like I know there are skinny type runners that, uh, you know, and it does help to be lean and super skinny in ultra running and running in general, and they will be fast, but you don't have to be a certain body type in order to move and to run, you know, to take like, that next step on huh? to fall one step at a time. <laughs> yeah. Because honestly, like I don't, I mean, I'm pretty lean, uh, right now. I mean, I still have some weight to lose if I really want to be competitive, but my natural body type isn't like skinny runner, you know, I'm You're not probably, six, seven with like the 35 inch legs or right. whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would probably have a better time or easier time putting it on muscle, which is mm -hmm. why, like I said, I wanted to be a bro. And honestly, it's like, I mean, my dad's a pretty big guy, you know, yeah. we got pretty big people in our family. So it would probably better suit me to be like a bodybuilder or weightlifter than it would be to be a runner. But I made a conscious choice to become a runner. Mm -hmm. Even if it sucked, I, like I said, I, just started doing it and I don't understand why, but it was what I'm supposed to do. And so I want people to understand that even if you, I mean, I weighed 235 pounds and I was always the fat kid in school, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I say chubby sometimes to be nice to myself, but no, I was the fat kid. I was like <laughs> five foot, 235 pounds in middle school. Yeah. And I remember when I leaned out in my senior year in Julian, um, where the counselor there, she asked me, um, Hey, did you want to do cross country this year? And I kind of looked at her and laughed because I still saw myself <laughs> yeah. as fat. So I thought she was obviously joking, like, but she was serious because like I, 
I actually looked the part of a, a somebody who can run, but like I was fat in school, and it's interesting that you know some of the peop some of the kids that I grew up with in school, they saw me doing some of the stuff I do now, and it's kind of like unbelievable. It's like how did the fat kid end up running like hundred mile race? <laughs> One step at a time, just like everybody else. Exactly, and I think it's actually for the better that yeah. I, I saved myself, like. Because when, when kids, uh, they get, you know, if I had been put in track and cross country and stuff, there's a potential that I could have got burnt out or... Um, Overtrained your joints Yeah, or stuff, just right? like mentally, just mm -hmm. I would have gotten turned off to it because um, I got into it as an adult by choice, Yeah, you know? And so when I was 23 and 24, I started running. I'm 31 now. And so I feel like I not only saved my legs, um, but I saved uh my my mind from cause i actually do it i enjoy it you know yeah. and i still have a lot of enthusiasm for it and that enthusiasm is important in order to get you through a lot of these races otherwise like there's people who ran in high school but they'll never run again because they ran in high school and yeah i've met a lot of people like, especially like other sports too like uh, baseball or football where you know the family is really excited for they get to play and, and they're good and all this and they enjoy it but then it becomes their life so much that they get to a point where they're just like, you know what? I quit and I can't do this no more. Yeah. I've run into kids that were like, um, who played baseball and they did that. They had, a, you know, they did the after practice, sat there for another extra hour doing batting, you know. And after they got to like freshman, sophomore year, they're just like, eh, I quit. Yeah. And they just don't want to do it anymore, you know. Or they, they won't do it until they have kids themselves. And then they'll get their kid into it. And it's a tradition thing. But to actually want to enjoy doing that, it's, it's – I worry about my daughter with that too. My daughter's um, – She's an eighth grader right now, and she's a great runner. And uh, I took her out a few years back, and they had the longest walk. You were there, and I remember you ran all the way from the beach all the way to San Pasqual Res, which is in the mountains. Yeah. And that was pretty cool to see, to be there live and watch you run that. That was a fun and, day. Uh, that was a fun day, right? Yeah. A lot of people came out. People who do run, people kind of don't run or kind of mess with it. You know, we were all able to, like I ran, I think, close to 10, but I was doing them like a mile at a time. So it was real safe for me. Yeah. But my daughter, she got out there and ran big chunks of, of uh, road, and um i didn't know she could run like that i thought she would run like a mile with me and i'm getting back in the van and she's like oh i'm good you know and i was like whoa and she's just flying and so she's i saw there she's a natural runner oh, yeah, naturally able definitely. and so her sixth and seventh grade uh, year she was uh, participating in track and field and they'd have 100 kids out there and she'd be top five every time just running yeah. and just just light on her feet and just able to go and and i'd go run with her i couldn't keep up with her like we had to do a thing where um, we'd say, okay, we're going to run like four miles or something, but I'm going to run two, you run your four. And by the time you double back, you can catch me by the time I get home, you know, and, and she would still pass me up and, and, um, but she kind of fell off, you know, like, uh, yeah. she just kind of like, oh, well, you know, I kind of want to do other things. I was like, yeah. okay, part of me as a parent wants to go, no, 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 baby, you go to the Olympics. We got to stay on this. Let's go. <laughs> but then, you know, the other part of me was like, no, I don't want to do exactly what you're talking about, which is yeah. to just, just make it not fun, not something she yeah, wants to do. And, exactly. and so she took time off. And back in my mind too, it's like, you know, I don't want to overwork her, her development also. She's growing, oh, yeah. her joints are growing, her muscles and, you know, and I want her to be happy at the end of the day too. So she's taking time off and uh, sometimes she'll go out there and run. She's playing basketball now, staying athletic, but definitely it's hard as a parent to not want to push your kid when oh, you see, yeah. when you see potential them in a like potential, oh, oh, man, God. they're yeah, going to be no. the best, you know, and it's, oh man, it's she really hard. Definitely, she has, yeah, wow, like. Yeah, natural runner, like for sure. But yeah, yeah, I was never that, by the way. That's not my genetic. I mean, maybe it is, you know. I mean, my brothers and sisters can run, but I was like you. I was real chubby yeah. in high school. I was like, I was like two fifty, and and you know, I'm not six foot. I think I was like five five or something. And, yeah. And I remember it was my junior's year, or senior year of high school. I had a PE teacher, and she would run two miles with me every day, yeah. and real slow, just real, you know, just moving barely. And actually, I started out with like one lap, which is a quarter mile, and then after like a couple weeks, I did two. And I didn't realize it, but she was running every day and I'd go run with her um, to make up credits for non-suits and all that stuff. And then I actually kind of enjoyed like just running with her. She was an older lady and um, and she was really nice. And I had like talking to her and, we, and I got to where I was running two miles. Um, and I was like, wow, this is like, I didn't think I could run two miles, you know? Yeah. And I, I kind of looked forward to doing that. I did my whole senior year, even when I was playing sports. And I remember thinking then, like, I got to have some kind of genetics for this because I was still weighing two something. and. To yeah. run two miles, and I didn't grow up as an athlete in any way, to be able to run two miles is pretty good distance you oh, know, yeah, for definitely. myself. Yeah. And so I've always messed around with I've never done the ultra stuff. I've never even done a marathon. Yeah. But um, I did say in May, when that marath that rock and roll marathon comes, I did make the pledge to do a half, at least a half. Oh, hell yeah. So I'm going to do it, man. Hell I, yeah. 
if I am I I'm gonna take an entourage, so if I pass out, they can carry me through the finish line. But I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, you can definitely yeah. do a half. I mean, it's 13 miles. It's gonna be maybe two, three hours, and then you're done. That's it. You have the rest of the day ahead of you. Are you allowed to start the day before, just in case it takes longer? No, you can, but there'll be nobody there. <laughs> yeah, nobody's there. Some of the races that I do, they have early starts for like the slower people. Oh, do they? Yeah, okay. You start like in the dark or whatever, so uh, you have to carry a headlamp or whatever. So. Um, but yeah, you can. De- I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, awesome. I'm gonna go try. I'm gonna do it. I gotta do it. You know, I ultimately want to run a marathon once in my life. That's what yeah. I always said. And people who run are always like, "Oh, go do it. You'll be fine." Yeah, you'll be fine. But it's like to people who don't run, they go marathon. Yeah, right, dude. Look, That's like just, you know, it's, it's a mental block though. Yeah, it's literally a number. And so I'm okay. I'm a big numbers person, for good and for bad. And I realize that numbers have such an adverse effect on our mental. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's whether it's weight or distance or. But it's just it's literally just a number so when i'm when i'm going to these events like the 48 hour race the hardest thing is starting and realizing after the first hour that you got 47 hours left to run if you think about that that's going to kill you like mentally yeah. but if you just take it one step at a time and you just are in the moment then you can get through it and so don't it like my one advice is don't get too caught up in numbers, whether it be weight or distance or whatever, because it's just a number. The time is going to pass whether you run or not. So you might as well try to be productive and get out there and move. And the half marathon will be done before you know it. It's not going to last, like, like I said, longer than two yeah, or three hours, you know? Going to do a couple of hours of, of you know, you hardship. You could do one right now. Yeah. I would do one with you right now. Like if we, if we, <laughs> you just ran early. Exactly. We're going to have yeah. to end this show. And you know, back in my mind, on. though, I feel like I could probably do one right now. Oh, for sure. I, I, I can bust out five, six miles and, yeah. and be okay the next day to go for an, do it again if I need to. So yeah, I could be if a, I could do that, I'm sure I could double it up. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we can just go up the grid. We can go to Descanso and back. <laughs> and that would be like 14 miles. And then, you know, I mean, you won't get a medal for it or anything. I'll make you a medal if you want a medal. <laughs> Makes you me feel beat, good about myself. You can beat yourself a medal. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, no. The beating but, will take longer than the running, but yeah. Yeah, but no, that's the one advice I have is don't um <laughs> don't get too caught up in the numbers. Like okay. uh, I don't weigh myself. I uh, I'm thinking about how much I weigh. It doesn't make a difference. So I'm probably 165-ish. If I get up to 170, I feel fat, honestly. Like I feel like which that's like but you feel it the performance wise you probably I feel, feel it, it yeah okay. I, so I, that's another thing is that i can feel it like i don't need to weigh myself to know okay. that i'm heavier but if i do weigh myself guess what's going to happen I'm be like, 170 that's oh my god that's heavy like oh my god like it and then it'll eat at me but it i'm probably some some runs i'm probably 170 i don't even know it you know and but if I go into a race thinking I'm 170, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to suck, I'm going to suck, I'm going to suck. So just don't get too caught up in numbers, whether it be weight, distance, time. And like I said, the time is going to pass and it doesn't matter. It none of it matters. Just be in the moment. And if you have a friend, bring a friend with you um, and then you could chat with them and then it'll make, the, it'll make time go by a lot faster. Find whatever you can, any tricks you can to make yourself pass the time quicker. And I think that's the one... Um, allure behind it for me behind these events is you learn um, you learn different coping uh, mechanisms to deal with these endurance events and you know in life you naturally learn the coping mechanisms to get you through hard times and so in a similar way you learn coping mechanisms to deal with stuff that you think is hard or impossible is running uh, kind of a um, it's a metaphor for your life that I imagine huh you use that a lot yeah you know I, I think um I don't know. I don't. You think about life and why we're here. You think a lot about a lot of things when you're out on the run. I don't really uh, listen to music much. I might listen to a podcast here or there, but some of the times I'm just out there and just listening to my own thoughts and thinking. Mm -hmm. And then I have these uh, existential thoughts about running and these races and stuff. And I think sometimes, like, what if. um, So life, you know, is a lot like. A race you know you start off and then you there's a finish line and then um and then you it sucks like it can suck like in the middle of it and then you get tired and then you don't think you're gonna make it and then eventually like you cross the finish line and you're done with that uh what happens when we cross the finish line in life i don't know like i don't i i don't know one way or the other if like if there's anything after but the point is not in life is not getting to the finish line so much as enjoying life while it's here and and what i think is like um 
I think the reason why we're attracted to these, like ultra runners are attracted to these races, like, and we keep signing up for it. We go through this vicious cycle of like, oh, that looks like fun. And then we do it and it sucks. And why do we ever do this? This is not a good idea. Why am I out here on a trail at two in the morning? This sucks. I'm never doing this again. You finish, you feel okay. And then you say to yourself, I'm never signing up for another one. And then you sign up for another one. And then you do the same process. And so I'm thinking, what if life is like that? And we kind of opt into this life and we think like, hey, you know, that wasn't that bad. But we, you know, we we pick certain uh, lives. This is what I think. This is this is why I think we're we're drawn to it naturally, these races and stuff. Is because maybe life is like that in terms of like cyclical, uh -huh. where we die and then we we still need to learn things sometimes. Like, and so we choose maybe uh, okay, I want those two people who have like uh, certain problems, like you have a mom who's a drug addict or whatever. You know, they're going to teach me some things. I you know I'm going to opt into this life so that I can learn something. But you don't realize that as you're going through it. But as you get older, you start to realize like you learn things right and if if you are um if you have the right mind you can learn things about life but i think maybe um yeah maybe life is a lot like a race in that sense to where we we kind of opt into it but we don't know that we opt into it and it's important that we don't know that we opt into it in order to keep it interesting mm -hmm. because if we knew that this was just a game or a simulation or something then it would ruin the effect right but we have to keep living with this idea that it's you know, this is all serious and this is like in order to learn something more. And so when I think about um, why I got the parents that I got and stuff like that, or why do I have these adversities? Why was I born into one of the one tribes in San Diego that doesn't have a casino? Like imagine if I had a casino, I would be taking over the world, you know, blah, blah, blah. I have all yeah. these thoughts, right? And I think it's, well, it's because I'm supposed to learn what I'm supposed to learn. And I'm not going to understand what that is maybe until I get to the end. And maybe even then I won't understand, but... As long as I'm here, my my purpose is to understand, try to understand a little bit more each day as to why I'm here. You know, so that's cool. That's real cool, man. I mean, I think that sometimes, and then I, I go down these rabbit holes of the, you know, um, yeah. is it all a simulation? <laughs> oh, I, I believe I, in the simulation. Like honestly, I can't I, help believe that sometimes. I, yeah, yeah, things I, are weird no. that happen. And you go, wait a minute, yeah, man. No, you ain't full of Trump, me. Trump. Okay, I mean, Back to the Future. They predicted the uh, that Biff. Oh, Biff, Biff is, is Trump. Trump, man. Yeah, and then you had the Cubs winning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I knew as soon as the Cubs uh, won the World Series. You're in like thumbs up, right? No, I never watched sports, but mm -hmm. I happened to be at home with my dad. I was watching, and he was watching the World Series, and I'm like, "Oh, who's playing?" Because I didn't know anything about sports. Yeah, and I happened to be watching it, and then it was a crazy game. I never watched baseball at all, but it was the craziest World Series game I, mm -hmm. I have ever seen. They went into extra innings. It was raining, and it was just like insane. And then they won by like a hair. The Cubs won. It was like the first time in over a hundred years that they won. And I'm like, oh my god, Trump is going to be our next president. You know, and that's <laughs> yeah. how it's kind of funny yeah. sounding. But I'm like, no, no, no. That, that was a thing too. I know other people had that thought when after it all happened, they go, yeah. oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, because it's like, no. And then before that, I kind of had this like weird like vision that like um, when I was running one day, I was like. Uh, that there would be some anti-Trump graffiti or something like that, and that um, that he would make uh, people like erase like and paint over all the anti-Trump graffiti. Like I had this weird like vision of like, oh my God, he's going to become president. But um, I really feel like life is too weird sometimes. I feel that you know yeah. you know I had a similar experience with uh, when the uh, years ago after nine eleven happened when the Patriots won the Super Bowl. Yeah. I said, what? That's so weird that like in this yeah. year, the Patriots would go to the Super Bowl and win. And that, yeah. I mean, now the Patriots have won all these times and they've been a great football team, whatever. I, I don't watch football. I'm, I got my Kaepernick shirt on. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, I remember that year sitting there thinking like, everyone's hoorah America right now, red, white, and blue. And then you have yeah. the Patriots win. I just, it just seemed like it didn't make like it kind of didn't make sense but because it, it made too much sense right like if i wrote a movie that's what would happen in that moment yeah. like the patriots would win yeah. the super bowl and i remember just thinking like that don't make sense and i've had just a lot of weird coincidental stuff in my life oh, where yeah. i've really started to think like okay you're not fooling me one time i went to washington dc and i was there parked in front of the lincoln memorial and it was when the longest walk was yeah. actually concluding oh. and um we were there and it was a whole thing i was messing around with the key and it went down the storm drain 
Yeah. And I said, what the, how does this happen? Wow. And the cop came over and, you know, they should tow our cars. We're there and, and we're in a big white van, yeah. you know, in the, in the bird bus. And, you know, it, it looks like the, the Unabomber van or something. Like they should have <laughs> towed it. But they were being really cool, you know, and they were trying to get the key out for us and all this. And as I'm sitting there, somebody comes by and knows me randomly from San Diego. And wow. like, hey, how's it going? I was talking to them and they walk on. And I thought to myself, I was like, that is just so bizarre. Yeah, right. And my wife and kids are tripping out like, well, you know, people over here. I'm like, no, I really don't. Like they randomly were out for a concert, supposedly. <laughs> but I was just, it reminded me like a video game, like where you're walking, you run into a guy and it's like, oh, hey, how are you doing? But like in real life, that doesn't happen. Right. Not over there. And yeah, I've had no. so many weird experiences like that where like things fall into place. Mm -hmm. And like, and especially in, the, in a time where you go like, okay, this is not... Okay, yeah. you're not fooling nobody now. Right. This is too obvious that this is not real life happening. Yeah, but no. it's—I mean, who really knows? But I—I yeah. I, I believe that sometimes. Yeah, no, I think can't I, help I, believe that. Every time something like that happens, I take it as like a kind of a wink from the universe to let you know that you're in the right spot. You're, yeah, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So, because yeah, I there was like a series of yeah moments like that in my life where I'm just like. You ever have the moment where you go somewhere and you're like, I've been here in this moment, like this oh, has yeah. already happened. Definitely, yeah, I think those. about that a lot. You know, yeah, like especially like around here. Like, I drive a lot. You know, I drive for mm -hmm. Uber and Lyft. Yeah, so sometimes on a spot, it's that weird deja vu feeling, but with like a specific location. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I we don't know. I mean, we don't know anything, right? But I jokingly believe it's a simulation. <laughs> <laughs> don't lock him up. He's not crazy. <laughs> But well, I, mean, I am crazy, but like, <laughs> in other ways, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's crazy to not contemplate something like that. Yeah, that's the big craziness that people don't want to admit to. They just like they're so sure of things that they really don't know. Yeah, we don't know that we're in a simulation, not a simulation, or you know, we might our whole life might have been lived in a blink and we're somewhere in a far off bed in a coma somewhere. We don't really know, you know. Right. But there, to me, I see things happen like that. I can't help but think that sometimes, like we're in a simulation. Yeah, the thing know. is, what gets me is when people like to um, pretend that they know you know and i mean whether it be via religion or whatever it's like it's your best guess and it's off of other people's ideas and opinions as well but um but yeah i mean people who like to go around thinking that you know for 100 percent sure that this is going to happen after we die well yeah you know i listen to a lot of alan watts i don't know if you know alan watts no i don't think so oh he's uh so he's like um he was a, a guy who took a lot of Eastern philosophies and he transposed them for Western society. Okay. So it's a lot of Zen Buddhism type stuff, but he's a trip to listen to. Like he's a little bit dense in terms of like, it's hard to understand. Sometimes it takes a couple of listens, but he says a lot of like similar stuff as to what I was getting at kind of like, um, he doesn't believe there's a self or like, um, if you think about who we are, like, what does it mean to be you? What does it mean to be me? We have these ideas of who we are, like, who am I? Who is Philip Espinosa, right? I am this ego, this, uh, I am defined by maybe you. you. You see me as a runner. Essentially, my ego is like my Facebook profile, right? Like, what I yeah. do to the world. But, <laughs> We're literally turning into that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's but like we've always a, been that, yeah. It's like an image that we put out there, but that's not really who we are. It's... um. It's just uh, an idea of who we are, and who we are is a lot more uh, uh, simple than that. But we like to invest in um, this idea of the ego, the Western society right. does, because, like, I don't know, that's just how we... Well, people always say they don't know me, they don't know who the real me is, but, like, a lot of people walk around, myself included, maybe, I don't even maybe know who I am. Yeah. You know, like, we are talking about earlier about puberty ceremonies and, and, and trying to figure out who you are a little bit better, and... Having these different moments of life, whether it's your arduous run or going without food or a ceremony of some yeah. sort, to try to find yourself, understanding, deeper meaning. A lot of people walk around really don't know who they are either, and yeah. they, they act out on that maybe or whatever. But so, how is somebody else going to know who that person is? You know, right. from little episodic, you know, two minutes here, post there, a picture here, to try to figure out who a person is. Yeah. Maybe it's a job title. Maybe it's a. Um, what they're known for maybe it's a mistake or something good that they did or like you're a great runner so you know um but you know it's like do you really know what the person's like when they're by themselves or they're yeah. with i don't know it's it's really uh you're right yeah. you, it, who knows what a person could be i guess yeah so i think um that's also part of like the the healing aspect or the the meditative aspect of running is when you get out there 
you realize who you truly are and it, it gets stripped down to those bare uh those bare things that really define you as a human like the breathing the you know the movement and stuff that's who you really are and i think that's why a lot of, that's why it's like a meditative thing for a lot of people mm -hmm. and that's why it could be healing because all this other bs that you tell yourself that you are it's all an illusion you know that's that's what i think you know it's just it doesn't really i mean it's fun it's like a game but like really what are you and who are you you know there is i feel like very little difference between you and i but we like to invest a lot in those differences but you know it's it's all part of i think western society that gets us to like i'm not any of my accomplishments or it's not i am not what i do i am it's i'm who i am but it's not related to what i do like rubik's cubes or running or you know that's all fine but it's not really who i am who i am is who I am when I'm out there and I'm struggling and I'm breathing and whatever, you know? So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense though. You know, you know how you know that is if you've ever like had a lot of achievement and then had a lot of not achievement oh, <laughs> like yeah. or achievement taken from you yeah. where you just, you're like, I'm the same person or maybe even I feel like a better person now, but people seem to think of you different or they look at you different or like, if you identify with having a lot of hair and you shave your head, it's like, well, I'm still here. I'm the same person. Right. Like what's inside is the same and but i just don't have hair anymore it fell out or whatever i've gotten old you know and, yeah. and it's like i saw a i had a little bit of an epiphany not too long ago actually it's funny you bring up all the um the eastern stuff yeah. again the simulation no <laughs> <laughs> but I, I i read something and i'm gonna mess the whole quote up so i'm gonna try but it was something along the lines of like um that we're energy yeah. we're energy and when we pass on or whatever our energy never dies it just continues on right this is what the the, the quote was something to, uh, I don't know what the quote was, but this is what I was getting at. We're energy, right? And, and uh, they say energy never dies. And so your energy comes from somewhere or something. And your body is a vessel. So something along the lines of like, we're not a body with a soul inside. Mm -hmm. We're a soul with a, uh, with a, a body surrounding us. Yeah. And that body changes. You know, it's a little kid. It grows. Uh, you know, the hair changes color, falls out, whatever. We get big, small, whatever. Uh, but with the soul, whatever that is, you know, I think... Traditionally, we said it's kind of like a fire of some sort or an energy, you know, and whatever that is inside of us, it lives through all of that, you know, of your exterior. And then when you pass on and your out exterior falls apart and because it's like if you get your arm taken off or finger taken off, your soul's still there inside you. It's not like, oh, it's all altered, like you cut part of the soul off. And at some point when the, the soul kind of like falls off or peels off, whatever you know the, the out the exterior whether we do that through cremation or burial you know when we pass on if our if we're truly energy then we just go on into the whatever's out there right we just yeah. live on because it's kind of like well what happens after but we kind of don't ever go into well what was before like how can right. you have a human and another human have their own energy life source it's like I shake your hand. We don't make life doing that. Right. You know, if I go with my wife and I kiss her, we don't make life doing that. But for some reason, you do these other things. And we'll keep yeah. this show, you know, close to PG-13. But, <laughs> but, you know, we do these things. And and that somehow in that weird moment makes life. Yeah. It doesn't happen every time. It only happens in some miraculous moment. You know, in some, uh, you can do that 50 times with a person. Um you know, if and you don't reproduce. Yeah, yeah if you're lucky, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not on the same night, but, <laughs> but you know, but you do that one random time or sometimes people hook up just once and they make a, like literally almost a miracle happen. Two life forms make a whole nother life form, a whole new energy yeah. that's going to, who knows how long that energy will be around and disperse right. off. And so it's, it's really, but we don't truly understand that. Yeah. Like there's mechanics at play that science tries to understand. But why doesn't that happen, you know, in all these other scenarios? It doesn't. Right. And so anyways, that I read something, a quote that got me thinking all of that. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I can't think of it. But it was the idea, though, that, again, we're not a body with a soul inside of us. It was the idea that we're a soul that's surrounded by a body. Oh, yeah. And I was like, wow, that's really powerful. Because I hear priests at funerals say, you know, we go on to live in the kingdom of heaven and all these things. And I'm sitting there singing bird songs that are talking about our soul uh, soaring you know and flying out yeah. and you know it used to be our bodies be cremated and at one point we buried and now we're burying again and so the body just you know deposes or whatever but the soul goes out you know and that's how we describe it 
And I know other cultures have the, the very similar belief system or try a way to try to explain that. But um, yeah. just the idea that, yeah, there's something and I don't know. Yeah. And I feel like, um, yeah, I agree with a lot of that. You know, like um, I don't know a lot of things and I know I don't know a lot of things. I don't know a lot of things about what happens. But I do believe that we are energy, you know, that that I don't know. It's just like you meet some people and like their spirit, their soul. It's just like it's kind of hard to think like that doesn't go on. That it doesn't go somewhere else or where did it come from? You know, it's it's beyond just physical. Um, but, yeah, I definitely believe that we are energy and that something happens to that energy when we die. I don't know where it goes. Um I believe in ghosts. I believe in spirits after we die. So I know that much. But um, as far as like, oh, there's like an idea of heaven. And eh, I mean, it's nice to think about, but or the idea of hell. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, that's it's fine and dandy. But I mean, like if your idea of heaven is being around a bunch of Christian fundamentalists who are like, oh, you know, God hates fags. And like, that's <laughs> yeah. not my idea. That don't seem heaven. like heaven to me either. Right. Yeah. But they're convinced that that's yeah. heaven or whatever. And so like, I mean, what would heaven even look like? I mean, I have my idea. It's just hard for us as yeah. humans. to. And would it even be a place or a feeling? You know, right. would, would it just be a, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. That's that's some deep stuff. You ever? <laughs> this, is gonna, a, this is how all my conversations huh. go with like uh, with every Uber passenger. That is I have. That, no, it's funny. Like, oh, I'm at my spot now. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not one for small talk. So yeah. like, every talk that I have is like deep and like big. I, yeah, you know, like uh, so I've been driving for Lyft and Uber for four and a half, going on five years. And one of the things I like most about it is uh, having conversations with people. Uh And I wasn't much of a conversationalist before. I'm an introvert naturally. But having a conversation is an art. And being able to uh, carry out conversation and to develop a conversation is really, it's a beautiful thing. And it has allowed me to develop that skill of having a conversation with people. And, you know, it's just so many people that I've met, like, throughout the years. It's super, uh, it's super interesting because it's not really... uh, It's a situation that you don't find yourself uh, too often in. So somebody gets in my car, they're on their way to do something. It's a little snapshot of their life. They may be on their way to the airport to go travel here or there, whatever. But I get to experience them in this little moment of their life and I get to have a conversation with them. And it will be an organic conversation. There's no expectation for anything. There's no expectation to have a conversation at all. Um, Some people don't like talking, that's fine. but for those who do, there's no there's no assumptions or anything. You the yeah. person's in your car. You, you guys are trying to pass the time, so you guys talk. Total about strangers, it. so they yeah. don't care. Yeah. So it's the most uh, genuine uh, form of conversation, you know. I feel, and so I'll um, I'll learn things from them, you know. And they, uh, it's it's just so interesting how many different people and like all different walks of life, and that's the thing that's really a. Uh, uh, addictive about it but um but yeah i usually um sometimes i get bored and i will uh i'll just decide to throw random questions out there like uh and i'm not a small talk person so i'm not going to be talking about the weather or whatever football team i'll ask them like hey have you ever been in love and it's interesting sometimes <laughs> i'll get like different that. reactions yeah it's a deep question like it mm-hmm. catches them off guard sometimes but i asked one guy i'm like hey have you ever been in love and he just got like emotional for a second. Like he thought about it and he's like, yeah, I have. And it's like, he told me a little bit more about it. He's like, he's the first girlfriend and stuff like that. And it's like, wow, like that is awesome. You know, like, and not- you know what? He's probably thinking it's a simulation now too, because you probably know, right? randomly like came to that and he's probably yeah. thinking about that. Why is the Uber driver asking me about this relationship? That's big on my mind. Like <laughs> right, you just randomly exactly. shot in the dark and that no, was the... No, it's a, yeah, yeah, Lyft and Uber is kind of like that. I feel like it's like a Ouija board kind of in a way. Like I, <laughs> yeah, I you don't know go from yeah. here to there and I, sometimes the coincidences happen through Uber and Lyft, but wow. I'll pick up somebody and then I'll drop them off somewhere random and then I'll go throughout the day, maybe six hours of driving. And I'll end up exactly at the same spot, and they request a driver again. And it's they, it's rare for me to get the same passenger ever. But and it's usually location based. Whoever's closest to you, whichever driver is closest to you, that's the one you're going to get. It just happens to be that I'm in the same 
spot as I drop the person off and then I get them again. And it's like, what the heck? Like, I'm supposed to get you again? Hmm. What, what did you, you not tell me last time that right, I need to learn? exactly. Maybe I should ask you some more questions or something to help figure out. Oh, but no, there are some real, there are some real moments where I've like, I've been like a therapist or just like I've helped people out. Like this guy who was checking himself into rehab and he had like a bar fight last night, ended up in jail and his wife threw him out and he was on, like, on the verge oh, of suicide. Wow. He was on the verge of suicide. Yeah. And I got him, you know, I was like, Holy crap, you know, and you're an Uber driver, you're just expected to drive somebody from point A to point B. But the cool thing about <laughs> Good luck with that. Right. It's like a <laughs> quiet a quiet ride the whole time. Yeah, no, depending it all on works who you, out. Bye. <laughs> depending on who you get. Yeah. I think honestly, I'm not saying this to brag, but people are lucky to get me. Like Yeah, you might have saved someone's life without right. knowing no, it. No, I yeah. did. Like yeah. legitimately, he was like at his bottom. And I saw yeah. him at his bottom. He was like checking himself in. He wanted to go from Escondido to Point Loma. And um he yeah he lost his wife said i never want to see you again he had a kid it it was just horrible for him right but i talked him through i said hey man you know like i um it's interesting that you got me because it seems like you're going through an alcohol problem and you know an interesting fact about me is that i'm 30 years old and i've never had a drop of alcohol or any drugs and so i have lifelong sobriety Let's say that again in case people didn't hear that. <laughs> Never had a drop of alcohol, no drugs in your whole life. Yep, Lifelong yeah. sobriety. Like yeah, our no. old ones. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very fortunate that yeah. I am able to make that decision. I mean, but yeah, so I, I shared that with him. And I, I told him, I said, hey, look, I think there's a reason you got into my car because I'm going to tell you why I chose sobriety. And I'll, I'll tell you, like, I'm going to share with you, like, my life perspective. And he shared with, uh, he shared with me his life perspective. And we made a, a true, genuine connection. And it was one of those connections where I'm just like, holy crap. I dropped him off, and I think I exchanged a number. I said, hey, here's my number. If you need anything, just give me a call. Like, if you need a ride or if you need somebody to talk to, just give me a call. Yeah. All right. And so he messaged me after the ride. He said, thank you so much. Thank you so much, man. You don't understand what you did for me. That's crazy, man. I yeah, can't imagine. Man. And I'm like, wow. Here I am, just like a Lyft Uber yeah. driver. You know, most people, like, shit on Uber drivers and stuff, and, like, but like it really like he wouldn't have had the same experience like if he got somebody like somebody else who doesn't like talking there's a lot yeah. of uber drivers who don't like talking um but he got into my car and i i hope he's okay you know like yeah. but at least for that one day i had that effect on somebody and that kind of ooh that you know it kind of gives you like a high that yeah, kind of give you motivation i bet huh? oh yeah uh, so that's what i like about it doing Lyft and Uber is that there's a chance for a genuine connection and helping somebody in a way that is genuine and there's no like strings attached. There's no like whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, he's not hitting me up like for help and therapy sessions like after that. I mean, if he did, that'd well, be fine. need a couple more lifts. Can you drive me to, <laughs> right. drive me to Yuma or somewhere? I need right, to get a yeah, long talk yeah. in. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a, like, you know, there's a, uh, I've uh, had a lot of really cool conversations with people where we hit it off, you know, and, you know, you have dating apps where it's like you meet up with them or whatever, like uh, Tinder. And it's always just an awkward thing when you're trying to meet up with somebody and they have the expectation that, oh, I want to date this person maybe. And it's like, oh, do you want to have kids? There's all these questions that make it kind of awkward. But if I'm in the car with somebody and there's no expectation and I I have the most genuine uh, connection with them because there is. And we could hit it off too. It's like, oh, hey, you know, you're into this too, blah, blah, blah. They're genuinely learning about me without that weird kind of like, oh, this person, like, is he a good mate or are they (laughs) pushing some weird agenda to hook up? Right. Yeah. But yeah, that's what I really like about doing it. Granted, there's a lot of sketch situations that happen with Uber and Lyft. Sure. I imagine there are. No, a couple of times. Oh, there's only been a couple of times where I've like feared for my safety throughout it, but. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I picked up drug dealers before they used my car, the getaway car for a, a drug deal or whatever in the middle of the night. And, oh, wow. Oof, and, uh, Did I you pick- tell them that if the cops come chasing, they're going to catch you, them, not right. you? Exactly. <laughs> they're going to catch me, man. I go running. Yeah. They're gonna- <laughs> yeah, no. I'm going to wind up in a different state 100 miles away. <laughs> yeah, no, you, like, you just never know who's getting wow, in Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, because we get background check, but okay. the but passengers they don't. don't yeah. So they're all sketched And they're up. behind you. It's not like you have like a safety barrier, plexiglass. Exactly. And you know, the weird thing is like, Honestly, like, I get a lot of, um, it's weird because you, as a guy, like, I get it. I get the discrimination, like, against men because men are creepy assholes, whatever. Yeah. But I have gotten a lot of, like, people who, like, 
leave reviews that say, oh, he was kind of creepy. And I don't remember saying or doing anything. Just no, that was why you're just quiet. <laughs> right, just driving. Or he looked in the rearview mirror at me. I was looking at traffic. I wasn't looking at you. Like, <laughs> you know, there's so many yeah. accusations that happen like that. And I, you know, sometimes when you uh, drop a passenger off, you drop them off, and then I'm parked there in like a mall or whatever, and they go off and do their own thing. I'm waiting there for another ride. But then the same girls that'll come back and say, uh, "Can you leave? It, you're kind of creeping me out here." Uh, oh you, really they get yeah. weird about you just not pulling off real quick yeah like you're what? we, we want to order another ride and as you under you might understand you know two ladies they might you know oh okay yeah and so i'm like okay i get that. they got to do what they got to do is to protect themselves and right put themselves safe scenario yeah but... and so i get that they... so you're, you're saying you've given the creeper vibe a few times i guess i don't know <laughs> That's what it crazy. is well you know but you know how would they know or not know yeah but yeah, yeah. so it's like they i know be... you so i know you're not creepy but right. if someone doesn't know i mean yeah yeah you so, never know what you put out there what you put off you know yeah. same time you got guys like what's that serial killer it was a bundy you know yeah. he had all these women that loved oh, yeah. him and he's like clubbing them in the back of the head and right <laughs> he's killing them in the back but well, everyone loved that guy it's usually how it goes yeah Those sociopaths are really charming and yeah really, like they attract a lot of women like uh there's that new netflix thing with aaron hernandez i haven't seen it but i keep seeing the memes oh you my know God, yeah. the memes are cracking me up i'm like what is this that's so true it's like uh the women would love him, you know, because it's yeah. like, I mean, first of all, he's attractive, but then he's like rich and he has a lot of status and he's probably a really charming person. And that's what it, that's what is attractive, you know, and yeah, like if you are genuine, nice, like me, like I like honestly, like I when I was single, I was single for about three years and I was I was kind of half heartedly trying the dating thing or whatever with yeah. Tinder or whatever wasn't getting anything and you know why that is you know why that is why is that well because because you don't make a million dollars i'm a lift driver and uber driver you <laughs> yeah. know like it's like nobody wants yeah. to be dating that meanwhile much. you got a job you're taking care of yourself you're responsible exactly. you got a degree or, and you know what i got a lot of you got a guinness world record <laughs> <laughs> exactly i'm not gonna you know, top myself up or anything but yeah. it's like a lot of people would judge you based on those superficial things and beyond all yeah. the accolades and stuff i'm a really nice person genuine person, sure a good person a good person to be a meat, but like nobody's gonna really see past that, you know. And so, yeah. like, we live in that superficial world. But if I was an a hole, and if I did talk myself up, or if I was like a certain way, like abrasive, and that would reek of confidence. And confidence is what really is attractive, right? But if I'm humble, and if I'm just like, no, nah, I'm, you know, I'm not that, you know, I'm, I'm all right, you know, I'm, I do something, I run occasionally, or you know, it's like, oh, can you solve that Ruby's cube? It's like. Yeah, it passes the time is usually what I say, you know, yeah. pass the time unless they ask for more. You don't just pull it out one hand and just do it like 10 right. seconds. Like, yeah, well, <laughs> like you always I, mean, do. I, <laughs> I might solve it sometimes at a stoplight or whatever, yeah. but like it's never to like, hey, look at me, whatever. But it's just not I'm the most thing. humble. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I'm the most humble and I, I'm like, I can brag about that, right? Yeah. But, man. Man, that's so you keep talking about this Rubik's Cube. People don't know, man. Philip is a... Um, icon in this part of the world for Rubik's Cube because I say that because I've, I've you know I've seen you at gatherings uh, I've seen you at events I've seen you at schools um, I've seen you work with a lot of youth and stuff and you just do that Rubik's Cube and then like years later I'll run into some of those kids and they're like hey whatever happened to that Rubik's Cube guy you know and I'm like oh you know he's doing good and whatnot but they just the net, they don't forget watching you do the Rubik's Cube and most people think of a Rubik's Cube, they're like, oh yeah, I you know, solved it one time, it took me a week, or you know, or I took it apart, put it back together, and, and all these things. But to actually see someone live just go do 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 and have it done, and then to see one in each hand, do 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 <laughs> have it done, and then to see the blindfold go on and go do 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 boom, and have it done, it's crazy for people to see that. And I think uh, in some ways, I think, especially kids off the res, it's weird to see a native do that. Oh, yeah. A native raised on the res do that. Yeah. So I think you get these weird things that, oh, those people are all from Japan who can do that. Right, or, yeah. or somebody from somewhere else, some yeah. some autistic kid from the south or something. But like some guy down the res, you know, can do this. And it's like. Yeah, oh, no, that's like, um, that's the coolest thing about it is that like, so I started this when I was in high school in 2005. And um I got really into it. I didn't know I was going to be good at it. I just was really competitive. And so I got really good at it. I was like, uh, maybe I started off, I solved it in like uh, five minutes or whatever. Like not the first time. First time it took me like a week 
Um, but I was eventually able to start getting it down to like five minutes at a time. And then I wanted to break school records. There was a kid there, uh, his name is Aaron Smith. He was a Mormon there and he uh, was really smart. And he was able to solve it in a minute and a half. And I was like, oh my God, a minute and a half. That's like, how do you move that fast? There must yeah. be some kind of secret. And eventually I beat his record. I got down to a minute and a half. One, one day during um, English class or whatever in the middle. I was you guys have a Rubik's time. Cube off? Ooh. Yeah, no, I, I, we were watching a movie. It was all quiet. And I like, yelled my, my ass off. And, but yeah, I broke, I broke that record. And then there was this other kid who was, um, I think his name was Chris Otters. He was the kid that was like so smart, like in math class that uh, Mr. Cornelison, that was his name. God, the math teacher would uh, just let him slide. Shout out Julian High Eagles. Right. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Mr. Cornelison who just let this kid just pass without ever showing up to class. Shout out to you. That's good teaching. So yeah, this kid he believed was, in you. Nothing right. wrong with that. Nothing wrong believing in the kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so this kid is like a smart yeah. kid. And he, like, his record was 50, uh, 51 seconds or something, but I beat that, you know. And so I started going up and up. And then eventually it was like, what's the world record? You know, I wanted to set my sights higher than that. I was like, 11. What's the world record? Well, you're at some the, small school where you're beating the couple yeah. kids there. Julian, what's like, the world? Like, like 200 kids, you know. And, yeah. And so it was a, I was a, I became a big fish in a small pond type thing. Yeah. But when I went to UCSD, like, the next year, I became a small fish in a big pond. Right. Yeah. And so there was a kid there named Kevin Wu. And Kevin Wu, he was like my next rabbit. He was like uh, 19 seconds he can solve it in. I think his record was 15 seconds. Wow. And I said, I want to beat that now. And so I eventually got faster than him. And I got tired of racing him one-handed. You know, like I was like, okay, come on. You're doing a two-handed. I'm doing one-handed. I mean, he's a cool guy. I'm just, you know, <laughs> I'm being, uh, you know, I'm trying to admit that confidence. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, so yeah, like I eventually beat. I him. think just doing a Rubik's cube in under a minute, you have the confidence. You know, you can. I mean, oh yeah, that was like if you can do it under a minute, that's all you need. If I was on a date, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd have someone just randomly. I'd be like, I'd give someone five bucks to walk a Rubik's cube over to the table and drop it. Like, oh me, excuse me here, <laughs> well, where did this fix come it. From? Here you go, fix. <laughs> have a nice day, ma'am or right. sir. Let them walk on and be like, back to what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, no, um, but yeah, like I. I started, yeah, a minute is all you need really to impress people. But I, yeah, I was like, okay, I want to get under a minute. And if I can get under a minute, that's awesome. And I wanted to get under 20 seconds. And I told myself, if I can get under 20 seconds, I'm going to stop because 20 seconds is impressive enough. Like 20 seconds is like world records type stuff, you know. But as with my running, uh, <laughs> it didn't stop. And so I got really competitive with it. I started competing. I got down to like an average of 10 seconds for solve and that's when i was a north american record holder i became like six fastest in the world i started going to u.s national competitions world rubies cube championship i traveled to germany for the world rubies cube championships and that was pretty fun that was like the furthest i've ever traveled and my cousin sweeney like i'm you know I'm, i was still like poor and broke at the time and i'm like man i want to go to world championships but i don't have the money she hooked it up with like a little bit of money so she can get me to germany and so I was able to go there because of it. Oh, wow. I didn't even go to Germany for that. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. This is my first time going out of the country. And that was awesome. So it's pretty cool to have turned a hobby into something that was like an actual cool experience. Now, with the Rubik's Cube, it's not like there's a lot of money behind it. It's more just for like the love of it, for the bragging rights. So, I mean, I spent a lot of uh, time and money just you know, going to these competitions and uh, developing my, my rank and stuff. But, I mean, it wasn't something I can live off of or make a living off of. I mean, I won maybe like a couple hundred dollars here or there for like, you know, national championships or whatever. But it was always something where it's just mainly for the bragging right. So right now I can solve it. I still, I still solve it, not competitively. I stopped yeah. competing. I peaked in 2010. And then I kind of uh, teetered off in 2012, 13, 14. I, and then you kind of grow out of it. And then I started running. Um, but yeah, I'm still able to solve it. I still solve it. It's more of kind of like a, an anxiety thing for me. It's like a smoking a cigarette or like a fidget spinner or whatever. Okay. So like, it kind I, of relaxes you to kind of get it. Yeah, and I can, okay. like, I can talk to people while like, um, solving it's it. It's the most technical it. stress ball in the world. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but I don't. I don't compete with it anymore, okay. but I still can solve it in an average of like less than 10 seconds. You know? Wow, that's pretty um, remarkable. But yeah, the Rubik's Cubes these days they make are really incredible. So this is a speed cube and it has magnets in it. It's magnetized. So what that means is like when you turn it, there's magnets in there that will help oh, align even the cube. Oh. 
So when you're turning it, it helps improve your turning accuracy. You can see it like kind of snap. Are there people that get like a carpal tunnel from doing that? Oh yeah, that's me. Is but it? I've solved it close to probably a million times. Like oh my God. legitimately, not even exaggerating. Yeah. I was thinking about yeah, it. Since, I've been doing it since 2005 and it's now 2020. That's 15 years. I remember one time you came out with the kids. You, 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 you probably did it 50 times there in like a half hour, an hour or whatever. Just because yeah. you kept showing like different things about how you could do it. And I remember there was a couple of kids that were kind of like challenging you. They were pretty fast too, but... You were doing it in one hand, like, you know what I mean? But you, I just, I was thinking that. I was like, man, he just did that, like, a bunch of times. No, like, my fingers are going to die. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it's already, like, hap eh, you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis runs in my family. So it's okay. just whatever, you know, it's, I'll probably get it. But whatever. It's like when people say running, it's like, isn't that bad on your knees? Aren't you gonna well, I might as well use it while I have it, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to wait till I'm like 60 just so I can be like, oh, I'm going to, I say, I'm glad I saved my knees for this. You know, <laughs> now I can yeah. do all this running and stuff, you know, no, you got to use it while you have it. And if, if my, um, if I get rheumatoid arthritis, that's not going to be fun. But, but you know what, man, there's beating your knees up, but like walking around at two 30 when the, that's not helping your knees either. Right. So, I mean, it gets exactly. to it off a little bit. Exactly. So, you know, and you know, doing the Rubik's cube, I mean, I think about cell phones sometimes. We're on our cell phones doing all these things, especially if kids are gamers and stuff. Yeah. Like that, we haven't seen the long-term effects on that on, the, on humanity yet. Like what's going to happen when you're just 20 years of just messing on your phone nonstop. Because there's times where I'm like, I have to get a lot of work done and I'm on my phone and I'm, or I'm typing and everything. I'm just like, oh my gosh, man, my hands, my forearms, my, yeah. I'm tired, you know, yeah. beating is like that too. So if I throw beating in with my cell phone and then this and that, at some point I'm like, okay, I need to stretch my hands, my forearms. I have to do the... I have to get up, make sure I move around. Cause you give yourself blood clots. You sit there too long. Yeah. Thing. But um, these are things that all you guys who are beginner beaters out there, make sure to get up every you know twenty minutes and move around and stretch your arms out. Stretch, you know, it yeah. is all of these little things that you do. You don't think of them as athletic, uh, you know, endeavors, but you can make you can hurt your muscles. You can hurt your your oh, blood yeah. flow. You can you got to get up, and move. You got to stretch. You got to treat it kind of like a sport almost. Do you ever a uh, speed beat? Is that a you thing? Know, <laughs> I don't know that it's a deep thing, but I made it a thing. I've done really? that. Yeah, I've actually had that where um, I'm beating. Wow. Usually, it depends what I'm beating, but you know, I have to really put that time. But when you do the backing, yeah. sometimes it's very monotonous. And I'll yeah. think to myself, okay, if I can get to here to there by this time, let's see if I can do it. Then Dang. I'll like challenge myself. And I used to do that more than I do now, but yeah. there was times where I really get into beating and I'd want to like, I would beat for like 10, 12 hours straight. Dang. Again, that's what I have to remind myself. Like, oh, I got to get up, stretch, got to do my thing and then sit back down. And then I would say, can I get to here to here by that time? And let's see if I can, you know, I would kind of do a speed beat type of thing. That's crazy. Um, but it's, I mean, you got to need, most people I don't think do do that because I yeah. think it's very much like they got the sage burning and the nice music playing. It. <laughs> but I got like the TV show, I got kids running around, I'm cracking jokes, I'm talking and I'm doing my thing. And so someone like, let's just see if I can get cracking and I'll just go to, you know, so so I have you, done that personally. Yeah. Would you say it's like addictive or? It can be. Yeah, very much. Especially okay. when you're first starting out. And when you first start, you kind of sucks. You're kind of just like, oh, I'm trying. But the moment you kind of do something you're proud of, then it becomes addicting. Like, oh, man, I want to beat everything, you know? Like, And you want you get, like, really into it, and then you just want to finish your product. And there's definitely, nowadays, probably more so than a long time ago, I imagine, now, like, there is the pop of having, taking a picture of it, putting it on, on Facebook oh, or Instagram, yeah. and everybody, oh, my God, you're the best yeah. beater in the world. You I know that definitely it. has, you get a oh, chemical yeah. release from that. Um couple years ago i was kind of feeling that i think you know and yeah. and it would motivate me and push me to keep beating and i had to just i literally took like six months off saying you know, i need to just like um detox myself from that <laughs> <laughs> and so recently i kind of don't do that so much or if i do post a pic i'll post like a bunch at once and i'm just kind of like over the uh, but i beated a crown a couple crowns this last year and um they got a lot of attention yeah. and I put a lot into them, so they should have, but, yeah. but, um, not to toot my own horn, but, um, <laughs> to, no, not to toot my own native flute, but now anyways, um, but I, I felt that come back. I was like, Whoa, man, you know, I had to, yeah. I had to kind of step away from the phone and everything. So I was like, uh, I kind of feel like, yeah, I did beat that, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's a nice motivator, oh, but yeah. definitely anything you do something like that, that gets positive notoriety. I feel like, yeah, you, you do get that, uh, yeah, no. the chemical release, that pop. And then, if you're not cognizant of it, especially, then you fall into the, the, the dangers of that. If you know that's there, I feel like you can kind of defend yourself a little bit. Be like, oh, I need to, I need yeah. to calm myself down a little bit. Yeah, no, that's why I'm very uh, conscious of the way, of the things that I do. Um, yeah. Because I have an addictive personality, so like yeah, so do I. I think it's yeah. a native thing. I say it that way. But maybe, or maybe it's like a product know. of trauma. I don't know. 
I, you know, they always talk about the intergenerational trauma, and that's definitely one of the things they talk about is that addictive personalities, you know, and, and it's hard to come from a reservation that a tribe that's had so much trauma to not have some of that, you know. Yeah. Even if you do have parents that were real mindful and, and turned it, or if maybe your grandparents were the ones who turned, you know, that those, some of those cycles off, you know, it's like, but it's still there. It's residual. Yeah, I, I so, think, I don't, know. I don't know. I don't know if it's, yeah, I don't know if it's in the blood or if it's part of the trauma or maybe a little bit of both. But uh, definitely, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of the things that I do are addictive in nature, which is why mm -hmm. I choose to abstain from, like, drugs and alcohol, because God forbid, I mean, could you imagine the 100 mile equivalent of like drinking or doing drugs? You know, you'd be I, dead in a month, dude. I'd be you'd, dead. you'd be yep. doing like meth or something, and then it would go to like you would just be done for sure. Man. Your heart would explode, and so that's why I say I'm thankful, especially if you try to mix it, right? You do like a thousand mile run, <laughs> you run for like a month straight, you'd be poor as gum. <laughs> Hey, I'm sure, I'm sure there are people out there. I, I look at these events and I'm, I'm thinking like, God, there's got to be somebody on here, like out here on Adderall or like meth. Like for sure, like some of the multi-day events are like 100 miles. Like to like, get the last 50 miles in or something? Oh, yeah. Or last, whatever, you know, five hours. I mean, I've never done meth or Adderall, but I know the effect that it has on you. You tweak out and oh I mean, God. come on. I mean, if like these people are tweakers, like the people who run throughout the night, like yeah. people like me, it's like, that's like tweaker tendency. Like. Who, yeah. who the heck is like running around in circles <laughs> at night like for no reason yeah like, come on so yeah I try at least to... you know that because i do, do people who run do that not know that not know what like like that people would might think that like oh yeah they probably i don't know it depends on like if they are raised with like tweakers or whatever yeah. you know like but yeah i'm very familiar like yeah i mean but yeah so <laughs> it's four in the morning you're out there just running laps in circles right it's <laughs> like who the like I think about that sometimes, and so I'm like, yeah, it's a good thing that I have the hobbies that I do, like we're yeah. just Cuban running. I mean, everything in extremes is not good for you, but I don't give a fuck. Like, yeah, I like with <laughs> Cuban running. Like people are like, oh, that all that running is whatever, you know. Like, I mean, yeah, okay, but I mean, yeah. it's either this or extreme like laziness for me, and so. Pick your That's why I've never in my life smoked like marijuana. You know, now it's all legal in California and. You know, everybody has their own opinion on it or whatever. But for me, yeah. personally, I never went down that road because, not because I've demonized it and, like, yeah. you know, not once. I always joke around, like, smoke it just once, you die, you know. <laughs> but it's, you know, all those, like, old memes and stuff about it. But but I was worried that um, that I would, because of my personality, that I would enjoy it too much or I would, like, I would just, like, it would just consume so much of my life. Because yeah. I'm, I'm that way, like, with beating. I started beating. I really liked it. Next thing you know, it was consuming my life, you know. And I just kind of will get that way. I'll enjoy something and I'll just kind of, It'll consume a lot of my life. And I know if I do that, it's going to take away from everything else I do. So I just never went down that road. And I've never really needed it, you know. So yeah. I just said, well, I'll just better leave that one alone. Yeah, um, that's good. Because um, I worry about, yeah, like it leading to something else. Yeah. I don't know. I just, well, the, the, when you know you have an abusive or addictive personality, yeah. you have to be very careful with what you get into. You absolutely oh, for sure. do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like even though it may not be addictive in terms of a bi biological or physiological sense necessarily, yeah. it can still be, you can still get addicted to lifestyle or life patterns. Like, I mean, like with running, I'm addicted to that lifestyle, you know? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you could you could find yourself addicted and turn into like a stoner where that's all you do, that's all you like put out mm -hmm. there in the world. Like, this is what I am, you know, 420 every day, you know, it's like, this yeah. is who you are, but... So to that extent, it could be kind of a bad thing because you can get addicted to that and de not dependent on it, dependent on it in like a very casual sense, like in like, like your morning cup of coffee or something like that. Yeah, well, I'm going to do Starbucks sometimes or not even Starbucks, just coffee. I never yeah. used to drink it. And then I started drinking it. Yeah. And you're right. It's like a, in the morning, I want the cup of coffee carrying around. It warms yeah. me up. It's the whole it's beyond just the caffeine waking me up. It's about like the whole process of getting it. Oh, and, yeah. We're and, creatures of habit. Habit. And so. Mm -hmm. Like you get addicted to that habit, and I, when I would toy around with intermittent fasting and stuff, I would like not eat until two p.m. or something, and then eat. I was on a, I call it the one bad diet, one B A D diet, mm -hmm. one burrito a day diet. And so what would happen is I would eat literally just one burrito a day. I'd wait until like two or three, wow. eat a burrito, and that's it for the rest of the day. It would be a pretty good sized burrito, like a breakfast burrito. Yeah. No meat or anything, just like eggs, beans, cheese, potatoes, or whatever, and that would allow me to make it through the rest of the day. But one thing I noticed is it was always hardest on that first day breaking the routine of whatever I was eating. Like I like I said, I would eat those um, those protein cookies or those complete cookies. Yeah. Every morning I would wake up and I would have that and maybe I have like a 
little fizzy drink of like um uh like a caffeinated fizzy drink like they have some you know like yerba mate type stuff or okay. whatever and so i'll drink that and you you get used to that and you know and then when when it's the first day i decide like okay i'm gonna start fasting again is like you wake up and you're like mm, maybe i could just do one more day and i'll start tomorrow kind of thing and it's not it's not an actual dependence like a phys- physically i'm gonna be fine yeah but mentally the psychological like, dependence oh, i keep strong, thinking yeah. about it and it's like it's not going to kill me just to have a little bit or blah, blah, blah. But, you know, pushing through that first day is hard. But then the following days, it's like it becomes easy. And then you get used to the fasting and the intermittent fasting to where you think like, well, why didn't I do this before all the time? You know, it becomes the norm. It becomes like, yeah, this is really easy to do. I can eat one meal a day for the rest of my life. Yeah, But then, absolutely. you know, burritos come back into the picture. And then, you know, like, <laughs> I remember how good this I like that this fast, by the way. One burrito day. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. No, I lost weight on the one burrito day day. I, I bet, yeah. Yeah, so if you eat just one burrito day, you can get it. You can lose weight. I wanted to do that because I wanted to put out the message. You can lose weight eating a burrito a day. Yeah. You can lose weight eating burritos. Well, yeah. I think there's definitely, you know, everybody's like, uh, they get it. Like, it's, I've been trying to push this 2020 healthy. Let's, you know. We've had a couple run other runners in here and stuff and just trying to get people thinking about health minded stuff. You know, on the reservation we know like my res here, uh the average age of death is, is low forties, like forty two, forty three. Yeah. You go to Alpine, it's like it's like in the seventies. Yeah. And that's five, ten minute drive from here. And a lot of that is diet, you know, and lack yeah. of exercise and, and the different abuses and stuff like that that has killed off our people, diabetes and all this kind of stuff, heart problems and stuff. And so I've been trying to like push the the, the health stuff and it, it's a good time to do that at the beginning of the year. You know, some people try to shame you for that. Oh, you weren't here, you know, in December. It's like, so what? Just trying to start off the year right. Good. Get in there. Go work out. Go for your walks up the, you know, wherever you walk and whatnot. Try to eat better. Yeah. But I feel like some people, they really do jump off, man. They're like, okay, I'm eating just an apple today. Or I'm eating just a cup of rice with a yeah. little bit of broccoli and, a, you know, one chicken. But it's like, and as you know, hey, if that works, cool. But to me, it's like, you can do these things in layers. There's layers and nuance too. Oh, yeah to you getting healthier, yeah. you know? If you go to McDonald's and you eat like five burgers and a you know, bunch of fries and you know, well maybe yeah. just cut that in half. Eat Me, I'm burgers, a fast food yeah. eater, I eat a lot of it. So when I try to get healthy, the least bit I can do is at least say, you know what, I'm not gonna eat all these burgers. I'm gonna go to a taco shop and eat some more realistic, like food that's actually made um, in more of a at home type of way, you know? Yeah. I'm gonna eat some, you know, I'll eat a, a pollo asada plate yeah. instead of eating you know like all this fried stuff you know right. or i'll eat grilled instead of eating you know all this fried stuff or yeah um, i'm not gonna order a soda i've been drinking soda in five years by the way new year's resolution oh, wow my wife and i said we're not gonna drink soda we haven't drink soda in five That's years crazy. um oh, yeah. no alcohol no soda no fast food and uh we haven't drinking not that i drank a lot lot before that yeah. but i just like i'd kind of tried it in my lifestyle and it wasn't for me uh-huh. and i just said my wife and i let's just kind of get away from it and but I said, really, sodas, which I was drinking like a six pack at a meal. It was terrible. I was drinking oh, way yeah. too much. We yeah. said, let's just try to cut it. So we cut it and we just never went back. That's um, awesome. But yeah, you can say, like, I'm just going to drink water with my meals. You can, like, you know, you don't have to kill yourself to try to be a little bit healthier. Yeah. But you should probably try to up it as you go. But oh, yeah, definitely. It doesn't hurt to just say, I'm going to go taco shop instead of a fast food. Yeah, the um, gradual changes is the best burrito. way. Yeah. The gradual changes is the best way to make any big changes that you want to make. And I think it is that perception of like this huge thing that you can't get to is what prevents a lot of people from um what is that saying um don't let the perfect be the enemy of the the good Uh um so the idea is like don't let this idea of having to be perfect destroy being good because you can still be good and work your way up towards becoming perfect so if you make gradual changes yeah if you eat four burgers uh or if you eat five burgers try eating four or maybe like Get an impossible. I don't know. Just try changing things. Yeah, switch and, it up. It doesn't hurt. Yeah, every time you change yeah. something, you know, you can gradually. Because I mean, I didn't start off running a hundred miles, so you don't have to like be daunt. You don't have to sign up for a half marathon or a full yeah. marathon. I do recommend signing up for an event though. Like if you want to challenge yourself or whatever to make today count, sign up for an event in the future. So you know, sign up for a five k. You can start off with a five k. A 5K is a long distance for a lot of people, but if you could tell yourself, allow yourself to say like, hey, I'm going to do this. I don't care if I run the whole thing. I'm, I'm going to try to run the whole thing, but even if I walk the whole thing, I Even if I run. barrel roll the last quarter mile, right. I'm getting it done. <laughs> but these people, uh, people think that uh, these things, like you have to run the whole time. So they, they get in their mind like, oh no, that's a long way to run. And they get into their mind about like, 
what is what does a 5k look like it's like you're running your busting ass the whole time but no just allow yourself take it easy on yourself mentally but still challenge yourself with things and sign up for a 5k and just let yourself say hey even if i walk this whole thing i'm still gonna do it and so if you uh so signing up for things i feel like is my next bit of advice is you want to make today count if you have something in the future that you can make yourself accountable today make today meaningful um, then it makes you more likely to uh, make a change in your life or to do something you otherwise wouldn't. If I say, like, yeah, I eventually want to run something or if I eventually want to lose this weight, uh, if you have, that's, it's not going to happen as, as much as it would if you had a specific date or event that you were preparing for. Like if you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do a 5K and I'm signing up in May or let's say, it doesn't have to be like in May. It could be 4th of July. I mean, that seems like a long time away uh, to me. But if you if that works for you, you can say 4th of July is going to be my first 5K. And I'm going to train for it. So next time you go out on a walk, you're like, I'm training for a 5K. And that makes you feel like, okay, I'm getting something done. Rather than if you're haphazardly just like, oh, I'm just walking around. So yeah. I feel like that's a really effective way. Listening to this right now makes me think about say, making the pledge and say, I'm going to run a full marathon exactly. in May. <laughs> it, no, you should do it. Thinking about doing it, man. No, you should do it, honestly. Like, you because, know what? I am. I'll do it right now. Okay. This just happened. I'm yes, going to run the marathon, happened. full marathon in May. You guys all heard it here first. If I'm you do it, I'll, I'll be out there with you. I'll run it with you. Oh, man. Yeah, so... So since you put is it is there out a there, chance I could die doing that? Yeah, nah. a chance. Oh, yeah. I mean, if my heart could explode or something. Yeah, crazy. I mean, it's happened, but it's not I'll likely. Look, you won't die. Just rip a knee, maybe. Yeah, no, you're in, you're in good shape. So I mean, all right. Yeah. So. All right, I'll do it. Hell yeah. No, I, you know, I, I, yeah, you know, that's that's motivating, man. Yeah, I can do a marathon for sure. I mean, it's like gonna I said, happen. Like five hours. You know, there's this, five hours. Oh, it is about five hours for an yeah, average like five, poor runner. Five yeah. hours. I can keep something going for five hours. And what I recommend you do mm -hmm. also is before this race, um, go out to a finish <laughs> train. <laughs> train. <laughs> like, oh, before, yeah, here we go. before this race, run. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but before this race, go out to a finish line of another marathon or another race, because that will change your perspective on what is possible you're if you're looking for motivation go out to the finish line of a marathon you'll see all kinds of people especially the five six seven hour range yeah you're like oh my god like i didn't know people like that can do it be like 300 pound people who are just like really walking they're just like mental toughness it. and you just get so inspired and you're just like holy crap what's you know what's my excuse kind of thing you're like yeah so you have in your head this idea that runners have to look a certain way but if you go to the finish line of a marathon or a half marathon and you see the people who actually finish a marathon it'll surprise the hell out of you so with all of the stuff going on and everything, and we're talking about goal setting, we're talking about making these like, uh, you know, I'm going to go run a marathon apparently. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. just so we are yeah. clear. And so that doesn't get edited out. Yeah. Ralph Christman <laughs> just said he's going to sign up for a marathon and it's going to be the rock and roll in June. So, yeah. I have one question. What do I got to wear? Do I have to wear a certain kind of shirt? Um, yeah, no, just make sure you wear band-aids on your nipple kind of thing. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know about the ones that I wear. And all right. You got to have waterproof band-aids, so... Because it gets really ugly. You don't want to get chafed nipples. You get bloody shirt. Yeah, I guess <laughs> chafing is a serious issue. Yeah. And you don't want to find out the hard way. So it doesn't matter what shirt you wear. You can wear, you can wear a shirtless if you want, you know. So. I don't Jam know if anybody shirt. wants to see that, but maybe. <laughs> maybe I'll be in shape by that time. I was like, yeah, hey, take it off. Hey, if you run shirtless, yeah. that means you don't have to wear a Band-Aid. So, I mean. But Interesting. If you, if you wear a shirt, don't wear a cotton shirt and wear Band-Aid. So. Okay, good to but know. Yeah, Ralph Christman running a marathon uh, June or rock and roll for San Diego. And I'm going to be his uh, entourage and I'll be out there helping you out. My biggest fear is about eight mile 18. I have to use the restroom. Yeah. But that's normal. Yeah, I mean, you just got to time it. You got to time <laughs> it. And so what I do is I eat early dinner, eat at like 5 p.m., 4 p.m., yeah. eat a, a light dinner, a heavy lunch, light dinner, 4 p.m., 5 p.m., eat dinner. That way, when you wake up, you can go before uh, before you start, so you don't have to worry about that. I mean, two, you want to make sure you try to go before, so that's why timing is appropriate. Uh, you gotta you gotta have the right kind of timing, otherwise, I mean, and it's only like five hours, six hours. So yeah, I mean, these twenty four hour races, like that's when you start having to worry about when and when you're on a trail or whatever, you just kind of just, you know rough it and just go. On. Um, 
you got to be careful not to use specific plants. So you got to know which uh, which plants to use or which plants not to use more specifically. Because uh, <laughs> uh, speaking from experience, I have a funny story about that. Because um, my friend one time, um, uh, Leo uh, Leo Ortega, he passed away recently. But mm -hmm. what's funny is that uh, he. He wiped his. <laughs> One day he called me up and he was like, "Oh man, I'm breaking out in hives and stuff." He realized he was using poison sumac to wipe his butt. One time when he oh, was like, "Oh wow, yeah," and so he had all these hives and stuff started breaking out. <laughs> oh, and I'm like, "Hey man, you gotta, yeah man, you gotta watch out. You gotta be careful. Make sure, uh, make sure you use the right plants. You know, I always make sure I use the right, you know, the right plants. So when I, you know, you know what happens next, right? Yeah. So I'm on a run, right, and I have to go to the bathroom. So I'm in Vista somewhere." And I pull off to a bush or whatever, and I get kind of desperate, and I just see this branch or whatever. I'm like, hey, that looks good enough. So I grab it. Guess what happens? I use it. I'm like, man, you know, I'm, I'm sweating a little bit more than usual. Like, yeah. Oh, I was going to anaphylactic yeah. shock. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you eat spicy things, you start sweating or yeah. whatever? I was, man, I feel a burning. Oh, no. Oh. And so I called him up. I'm like, hey, you won't believe what happened. Remember how I told you I always use the right plants? Well, karma, right? So I use, uh, you got to make sure you use the right plants. Or you bring some tissue with you or whatever, but um, yeah. <laughs> they have the little fanny pack, right? You got to rock a fanny. It's a lot of people rock a fanny pack. Yeah, or is that like what a, little packs, a little pack. A little pack. or whatever, mm, camel okay. or whatever. But yeah, I always, I always carry a buff too. But when you're when you're not like in the city, like you're out in the because uh, the rock and roll marathon or whatever yeah, marathon, yeah, I mean, they have porta potties city. there. They somewhere. have porta potties, right? Okay, but if you're out in the middle of nowhere, I know yeah. one time you did the hundred mile out in Cuyamaca. Yeah, uh, different places like that are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you just what do you, you, you just go you just do plants? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was this one time I was in the middle of a hundred mile race, the San Diego hundred, and they have this open area like meadows area uh -huh. and there's a bunch of runners coming by but i really really had to go i think it was, i'm sure they understand <laughs> yeah but it was like there was no spaces to hide behind no bushes no oh rocks my gosh, yeah. so i was just out there and i'm like okay this is gonna happen you know and i just i had to use a buff uh buff a handkerchief or whatever always carry a handkerchief with you or a buff if you can so um but yeah i had to go and i just it was kind of embarrassing but luckily the runners didn't <laughs> care they just keep going but um, but yeah, during the rock and roll, you're not going to have to like do any of that stuff. So. All right. Well, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Yeah. But, um, uh, one thing I want to leave off on is so all the, all the stuff that I do, um, I do it, uh, with purpose. I do it with the intention of showing people that things that they consider to be impossible can be done. Cause I once thought things were impossible, like the Ruby's cube running a marathon, um, all these things that are impossible, you can really, uh, you can really do it. And so, what I want people to do is uh, figure out something, uh, make today count. And you want to uh, find an event in the future or find something that challenges yourself, something you think is impossible, whether it be a Rubik's cube, learning how to surf, learning how to knit, learning how to bead, whatever, you know, and figure out how to do it. Jump into the pool and figure it out as you go along. And so um, everything I do, like the Rubik's Cube is a metaphor for like impossible things. And so, so what I try to make my purpose in life is showing that, showing to other people, particularly Native youth, because I care so much about Native youth, that things are possible. If you, if you take, um, we have this constructed reality, these reservations, this like whatever that, where I was always shown that this is what your uh, possibilities are either a jail or, you know, dying from cirrhosis of the liver. Like, these are your possibilities, right? But I was able to see beyond that reality, beyond what's possible. And for the most part, we as human beings only think what is possible is what is shown around us. But if you can take my example and see all the stuff that I'm doing and see that things are possible, then you can kind of change the reality around you. And so my favorite artist, Tupac, has this saying, reality is wrong, dreams are for real. And so that's something that I believe in wholeheartedly, that the reality that we're constructed with is all artificial. It's been constructed with us for our demise. It was meant to kill us. It was meant to kill us off. And so we need to understand that we aren't really what is considered our reality today. It's not my cousins who died at 30 years old from cirrhosis of the liver or my uncles who did or whatever. You know, we are none of these things that have been shown to us to be negative. We are much more than that. Um, you know, there's a movie Once We're Warrior. We were warriors, you know, that was about the Aboriginal in, yeah, um, yeah. in New Zealand, you know, and, and so we we are great people and we have greatness within us. And so the greatness within me is within you. And so you don't think that you can run a marathon or whatever or a 5K. You can do it. It's in your blood. 
And so whatever it is, surprise yourself and surprise others along the way. I like it, man. And thank you for the motivation. Thank you for the fire. I'm going to I'm gonna do it. I made, We made the, we, made, we said it, it happened here. Yeah, so. it happened here. With that, man, I want to thank you for coming in. Of course. Philip Espinosa, Mesa Grandi Rez, and beyond, the runner, and live from the Rez. Yep.